brute, ill-mannered, and illiterate. These were just the few words used to describe Cornelius Vanderbilt. Yet, the school dropout had amassed more wealth than any other American in history. Deemed a robber baron, Cornelius's rise to fortune is one of the most legendary tales. What's the story of the farm boy who grew to be the wealthiest man in America in the mid-19th century? Well, let's go back in time and see where it all began. Sit tight, we're going back to the 1790s. Coming from a descendant of Dutch settlers, Cornelius Vanderbilt was born on the 27th of May 1794 in Port Richmond, Staten Island in New York. Born to impoverished parents, young Cornelius worked on their small farm, and at the young age of 11, he dropped out of school. Alongside his father, Cornelius also worked as a boatman, helping him move cargo across the New York Harbor. At the time, the farmers on Staten Island who needed to transport their produce to the markets in Manhattan used the Vanderbilt's boat. But Cornelius enjoyed working on the water. When he was 16, he wanted to buy his own boat so he could go into the business for himself. Since his mother was a farmer, she didn't have lots of money, but she had some savings, enough to buy him a Perry Auger boat. But there was a clause. In exchange for the $100 loan which she agreed to lend him, he had to clear a very rocky field so it could be farmed. Cornelius, a hard worker, quickly took the offer and began working in the field. Soon enough, Cornelius realized the job was tougher than he thought, so he devised a plan and convinced other local kids to help him with the job, and in return, he promised them free rides on his new boat. Together, the boys cleared the rocks off the field, and Cornelius owned his first boat at the age of 16 with a $100 loan from his mom. In no time, Cornelius began transporting both freight and passengers between Staten Island and Manhattan. Being a skillful worker, his business thrived, and he was able to pay back his mother within one year. Apparently, he faced a lot of competition from other ship owners in the same business, but he was a crafty businessman so he came up with a plan to wipe out his competitors. His strategy was to undercut everyone and offer the cheapest prices on the market while providing the best services. He became known for the most reliable and affordable ferry service. He didn't just thrive while in the business, he invested all his profits back into the business after paying back the loan. According to local lore, he even earned about $1,000 for his parents during the first year of operations as part of their share in the profits. This made him buy more and more ships, conveying more goods and people across different routes. And because because he was known for his dominance in the business, he earned the nickname the Commodore. Cornelius's hard work earned him a much bigger contract with the U.S. government. During the War of 1812, between the U.S. and Great Britain, he secured a contract to deliver supplies and also ferry soldiers about the harbor. This evidently grew his business and his fleets increased more. Despite his devotion to his business, in 1813, Cornelia found time and got married to his distant cousin, Sophia Johnson. He was just 19 years old at the time, and his wife was 18 years old. Together, they had 13 kids. But since he was desperate for success, he had neglected his family and even lived unhappily with them, even though his reputation gained prominence. In fact, one of his children was said to have committed suicide because of him. Not only that, he briefly sent his wife to an asylum at one point. Such a fanatical, devoted businessman he was. But hey, that's on the personal side. Let's get back to the business side. Thanks to his thirsty drive, he enlarged the ferry service and even combined it with hotel services for passengers in New Jersey, which his wife helped him manage. But Cornelius could spot a need for a demand. He identified how to take his business to another level, so he began investing in steamboats. He figured the steamboats were more efficient than the ships he had been using. In 1818, he sold all his sailing vessels and teamed up with a friend, Thomas Gibson, and he was appointed steamboat captain between New Jersey and New York, and also the business manager. The steamboat market was a pretty competitive one, and at the time Cornelius joined Gibson, they faced a steamboat monopoly on the Hudson River, one granted by the New York State Legislature to the influential politician Robert Livingston and his partner, Robert Fulton, who invented the first commercially successful steamboat. But Cornelius was not a man to be put down easily. Robert Livingston and Robert Fulton had granted a license to Aaron Ogden to run a ferry between New York and New Jersey. Gibson decided to launch a steamboat venture because he wanted to run Ogden into bankruptcy. But to do this, he undercut prices and brought a landmark legal case, Gibbons vs. Ogden, to the United States Supreme Court to overturn the monopoly. Cornelius also fought the law by appealing his own case against the monopoly to the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, the court never heard his case, and on March 2, 1824, Gibson won his case. This ruled that the states had no power to interfere with interstate commerce. The partnership between Cornelius Vanderbilt and Thomas Gibson was a strategic one, set to make their competitors bankrupt. The partnership charged only a quarter of the competitive fares, and soon enough it became the dominant ferry service on the busy Philadelphia-New York City route. During the 1818-1829 time period, the partners made a 
a hell of a fortune. At the time, Cornelius moved his family to New Brunswick, New Jersey, where his wife, Sophia, operated a very profitable inn. And when Thomas Gibson died in 1826, Cornelius worked for Gibson's son, William, until 1829, when he decided to go back to working for himself. In 1829, he broke away from Gibson's and began passenger and freight service on the New York City Peekskill Hudson River route. Again, he applied his ruthless tactics by undercutting prices to eliminate his competitors, offer cheaper prices, steal all their customers, make them go bankrupt, and once they were out of business, he'd raise his own prices to more sustainable levels. At one point, he even offered some trips for free. It didn't matter if he was making a loss, the idea was to take out his competitors. And when the ship owners realized they couldn't compete with his pricing, he simply bought their businesses at a reduced price. Now you see why he was described as ruthless. Although, there were a few steamboat companies who tried to lure him away from the same trade routes as them. Since they couldn't compete on the same trade routes, they simply paid him a round sum of money. And here's what Cornelius did in 1934. He expanded his service to Albany, New York, where he faced competition with the Hudson River Steamboat Association. And when the Hudson River Steamboat Association also realized they couldn't compete with him, they ended up paying him monthly to stop his service in their territory. Cornelius was in the bag, as they say. But of course, every time he got a big payoff like this, his fleets just got bigger and his power and wealth increased. By the time he was 40 years old, Cornelius Vanderbilt was onto becoming a millionaire. By the 1840s, he had a fleet of 100 steamships and had become the biggest employer. At that point, he wasn't just competing based on price, but also on comfort, speed, luxury, and elegance. More reasons for his competitors to detest him. However, despite his wealth, the wealthy elites never considered him one of them. His lack of school education, his looks, and the way he talked considered him an outsider, unlike most of the upper class. But Cornelius used this to much of his advantage. He advertised his ships as the People's Line, affordable ships for normal, everyday people. Such a crafty businessman, but Cornelius was hungry for more. And in 1849, he discovered his next source of wealth. Now, you probably heard that people who got rich during the gold rush were the ones selling pickaxes and not even the ones who went in search of gold. Sorry to disappoint you, but do you know who got the richest the most? It's the ones who transport people to get there and transfer the gold back. You see, when gold was discovered in California, thousands of people flocked there hoping to get rich. Literally hundreds of thousands. That was the largest migration in the history of America. But California wasn't yet linked to the rest of the country by rail. And since Cornelius could spot a demand quickly, he began offering boat trips to California. Several others offered the same service, too. But here's where Cornelius differentiated himself. He discovered a new route to California by the way to Nicaragua. While his competitors used the longer Panama route, he was able to cut off the length of the trip, and it was 600 miles shorter. His exclusive deal with the government of Nicaragua made his trips faster and cheaper than his competitors, and that fetched him far more customers. And as a result, he became the principal transportation service provider on the East Coast to California routes. The more people went in search of gold, the more Cornelius got richer. This part of his transportation business fetched him over a million dollars per year. That's insane. But then, he made a great mistake, something he had never done before. In 1853, he took his first ever vacation. He was going to turn 60 years old, and since he had been working almost all of his life, he decided to take a break. So he had a gigantic steam yacht build and made a tour of Europe with his family. Then things went pretty bad for him. The two contract managers whom he'd left in charge of his new business, Morgan and Garrison, ended up betraying him. They conspired with the new president of Nicaragua, William Walker, who rigged his way to become president. The shady deal with the new president means that Cornelius's rights to operate as ships throughout the country would instead be given to Morgan and Garrison. When Cornelius found out, he knew suing them would take too long, so he sent them one of the shortest and most threatening letters ever. Gentlemen, you have undertaken to cheat me. I won't sue you, for the law is too slow. I'll ruin you. Yours truly, Vanderbilt. And ruthlessly, he did ruin them. He immediately started another transport service nearby and used his tactics of offering ridiculously low prices to steal customers. He then refused to transport passengers to and from Nicaragua to create a barricade of the country. As if that wasn't enough, he also helped start a war to overthrow the new government of Nicaragua completely. Indeed, he was brutal, because in the space of two years, he had taken Morgan and Garrison out of business. But soon enough, Cornelius realized his next moneymaker, railroads. Even though he was close to the age of 60 years, the age of retirement, You'll say, when it came to business, he was just getting started, and he was about to monopolize the entire railroad industry. 
in the early 19th century, when New England was witnessing a surge in the establishment of textile mills fueled by the Industrial Revolution, the need to transport textile goods efficiently soon became apparent. As the demand for efficient transportation grew, entrepreneurs began envisioning a railway network to connect New York to New England, thereby revolutionizing the transportation of goods and passengers. In the 1850s, Cornelius discovered the future of the transportation industry was no longer in the hands of steamboats but railroad technology, so he began investing in this industry, but instead of building new railroads, he simply sold all his fleets and bought the existing railroads. He then decided to diversify his investments and acquired shares in the Stonington Railroad, a popular and profitable line that connected Stonington, Connecticut to New York City. By the 1860s, it was already a force to be reckoned with in the railroad business. But his entry into the railroad industry marked a turning point. In his quest for dominance, he employed his classic shrewd tactic, cutting fares on competing lines. This strategy attracted a significant number of passengers to the Stonington Railroad, boosting its revenue and making it an even more attractive investment. Cornelius Vanderbilt's aggressive approach didn't stop there. He sought to take control of the Stonington Railroad completely by driving down the stock price of the company through his fare-cutting measures and subsequent increase in demand, he strategically diminished the value of the company's shares. With the Stonington stock price at a favorable level, Cornelius executed his master stroke. He acquired a controlling stake in the company, enabling him to assume the presidency of the Stonington Railroad. This pivotal move marked the first of many railroads that Cornelius would eventually lead. Also, during the mid-1800s, Cornelius Vanderbilt embarked on a series of shrewd business moves, acquiring the Long Island Railroad, the New York and Harlem Railroad, and the Hudson River Railroad. Later, he merged these railroads with the Central Railroad, laying the foundation for what would be known as the New York Central Railroad. Sources say he made about $25 million in the first five years from his railway venture. Cornelius' son, William Henry Vanderbilt, urged his father to expand rail service toward Chicago. Embracing the idea, they acquired several major railroads, including the Lakeshore and Michigan Railway, the Michigan Southern, the Canadian Southern, and the Michigan Central Railroad. This created the largest American railway system of its time. Behind every successful man is a woman, they say. Let's take a quick dive back into his personal life. Sophia Vanderbilt played a crucial role in Cornelius's life, providing valuable business advice and support. A year after her passing in 1868, a tragic loss for Cornelius, he married another distant cousin of his, Francis Armstrong Crawford, known as Frank, who influenced him to embrace philanthropy. Although Frank was 34 years younger than he was and younger than seven of his 12 children, it seemed the idea of getting married to a younger woman made him a different man. Cornelius hadn't engaged in philanthropy before, but his marriage to Frank led him to donate $1 million to Nashville Central University. In today's value, that amount would be equivalent to a staggering $260 million. This donation established what we now know as Vanderbilt University. As Cornelius aged, his son William H. Vanderbilt took over as the senior manager of the business. After a prolonged illness, Cornelius passed away in 1877 at the age of 83, leaving the bulk of his estate to William H. Vanderbilt, with modest amounts gifted to his other nine surviving children because he thought them to be weak and undeserving unlike his heir. The value of Vanderbilt's estates estimated to be about $26 billion in today's terms. And not just that, at his death, he had more money than what was held in the entire U.S. Treasury. Reports even had it that he had one-ninth of all of America's currency in circulation at the time. Yet he lived a modest life and asked that he be buried on Staten Island where he grew up. Incredibly shrewd, cunning, brutal, and short-tempered, many called him. But yet his legacy still lives on. And this is how Cornelius Vanderbilt revolutionized the transportation industry. From a school dropout to becoming America's wealthiest man. Don't forget to see Rene Lacoste's story here. And until next time, ciao.